Welcome, ladies, gentlemen, bears, Megans, and things to episode 88 of the Muppet Trek Podcast. I'm Jarman. And I'm Steve. We're here to compare, contrast, and confer our two favorite franchises about them tired. (laughs) What are those, Jarman? They are the Muppets and Star Trek. And we do one-to-one reviews of the Muppet Show and Star Trek, the animated series. Not Spark Trek, but Star Trek. And this week, we have special Muppet Show guest, Anne Murray, an animated series episode, The Magis, Magics of Megas 2. <laughs> Say that three times fast. I I think I would have gotten that wrong, even if I wasn't so tired. It's a ridiculous <laughs> it's, title. It's weird. And Magics with That's a CK. Right. Uh, but Steve, before with we get to that crazy ass episode, tell us about our guest star today, uh, Anne Murray. Well, Anne Murray is a Canadian with a C, uh, musician whose career ran for more than 40 years. Uh, she was the first female Canadian singer to reach number one on the U.S. charts, and she is a four-time Grammy Award winner. Mm-hmm. But what does our audience know her from? Well, I listened to her two biggest hits, one of which is performed during the show, Snowbird and You Needed Me. And I don't know if I'd heard either before. Our buddy in the North, Sean Vanderloom, may know her as she paved the way for many female Canadian artists to come. Huh. But that might be it. And uh, she had a long history, apparently, of uh, people thinking that she was a lesbian, and she's firmly denied it, but said she wouldn't have a problem being one. She just isn't one. But she remains single most of her life, and she gives us strong, um, strong lesbian vibes. Folksy vibes. <laughs> uh, she And fun factor, she did do her own voice in a 2013 episode of Family Guy, oh. where Stewie falls in love with her music and then seeks her out. How How strange. <laughs> Uh, but he immediately falls out of infatuation with her when she finds out that she doesn't write her own songs. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> uh, but what the hell is she up to this week on the Muppet Show? Well, backstage, there's like a loose subplot of scooters on a skateboard. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do get a nice moment of Zoot going to Anne's dressing room and looking for his saxophone. And him and Anne get a backstage performance of Walk Right Back. It's a lovely number with the rest of the Electric Mayhem eventually joining in. But that's really all there is of a backstage plot this week. Yeah. On stage, Kermit introduces Anne Murray, but tells the audience they have a surprise opening performance. We get Piggy and some hogs riding hogs, motorcycles, uh, and they sing I Get Around. And this is truly one of the most technically impressive and considered one of the ultimate musical numbers in Muppet Show history. Oh, I didn't know that. That's here in the Anne Murray episode. Um, Anne Murray hits the stage and sings Snowbird. It's lovely with fluttering birds that sing, and then a kind of foppish bird uh, comes out. A dodo is telling her she's got to leave the woods because they're going to bulldoze him. (laughs) We then get a Muppet News flash. Muppet Labs has, has invented exploding paper, and then his paper explodes. Kermit then sends us to Coosbane with a trudging alien creature who is narrating his actions and emotions harassed by some sort of other speedy creature this devolves into them beating each other senseless and then coming to a truce pacify pacify (laughs) it's actually really creative and good Uh, kermit introduces milton miller and his farmyard philharmonic Uh, we get a farmer with pig sheep and duck Uh, they sing is this the old sow each of the animals calls out as he hits them with the pitchfork. It's mildly reminiscent of the Muppaphone. Yeah. He hits the pig one too many times, and the biker pigs come out and gang up on him and presumably beat him to death. <laughs> Next up is Muppet Sports with Lewis Kazagger, and they are in Scotland to cover the to cover international bagpipe eating, uh, but the bagpipe fights back and shoots at them. <laughs> Um, somewhere, and this is sort of strange, somewhere in here is a missing song. Yes, I do that with the wiki as well. Beauregard sings a song called Dancing on the Ceiling, which ran into some rights issues uh, uh, due to a different, a totally different song of the same name by Lionel Richie. This is not that song, uh, but some somehow the, the rights are tied up in the name use. 
So it's, oh. it's omitted, even though it's not the same song at all. So I thought it was weird. Disney sometimes omits the UK song, but then they didn't omit that this time, but omitted that song. So that's, that makes more I sense. I think if they had omitted that and this, it would have been way too short of an episode. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it is a sweet number. Beauregard is in bed, uh, and a Muppet ghost girl dances on the ceiling above him. Uh, and hits the stage for a closing number. Everything old is new again. She is joined by a slew of Muppets on skateboards who drift and twirl th- uh, behind her throughout the song, crashing into each other and generally causing mayhem. Kermit thanks Anne Murray one last time and thanks Kermit, who falls off his skateboard and into a French horn. And that is what we call the Muppet Show. That's right. So, Jarman, what did you think of this week's episode of the Muppet Show with guest Anne Murray? Well, it starts off with me knowing nothing about Anne Murray, and then the dreaded thing happens that we've seen in like four other episodes that have also sucked, is mm-hmm. that some random blonde lady does a slow song while walking outside with birds. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's happened it was like pioneered, <laughs> pioneered by Florence Henderson yes. in season one she with I think butterflies in that one. Yeah, oh, butterflies. Um, there we go. She opened the door for other <laughs> mediocre blonde hosts. I swear her. to God, it's happened at least two other times, too. <laughs> but anyways, I was like, oh, no, not another s- terrible episode. But it got better. It definitely did. Um, and I, I think Anne Marie was just she was perfectly passable. I, I think her voice really saves. Her. I think she's a beautiful voice. It's very f- nice to listen to. Um, but she's kind of just low energy. Didn't really do a lot for me. And she wasn't doing any characters or anything like that. Um, she was fine with the Muppets, but just kind of just like there, you know, she was pleasant. She was all right. Um, and then we have a lot of weird numbers, um, a lot of bizarre numbers, a lot of slow numbers. Yeah. Uh, the aliens doing their thing on Coosbane. I could do with Coosbane being exploded. I, and it could go the way of the house, <laughs> the house bits from the first season. I just, I could deal with it not being around anymore. They're See, I just... like the concept though. <laughs> like I, I did, I, I, for I Coosbane, guess. I liked that they were like saying what they were feeling. And kind of narrating, so it wasn't just noises. That's true. That's the difference from the other Coos um, Bane ones. Where they have no words. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I thought that as a concept was was fun. It was almost like a mammoth play. Uh, <laughs> and then like the whole um uh the farmyard tri- trio, I thought was me kind of just like, what the hell am I watching? But then they kind of uh, made the joke at themselves at the end. But he's like, why aren't you guys singing along? And then someone says, because it's a dumb song. And I was like, that's great. That's what I was thinking. And someone in the audience says it. So that's hilarious. So it actually saved itself because it was that was really funny. I laughed out loud at that part. Um, and then he gets beaten to death. Well, yeah, that's what happens a lot on the show. People being beaten. Presu- um, presumably. Presumably dead. <laughs> presumably dead, that guy. And I wrote my notes. Anne Marie is that really classy aunt that you had uh, as a kid, but she never married or had kids. She just had her roommate Cheryl for her whole life. <laughs> and they owned they owned cats together. <laughs> yes. It's just her roommate. Um But yeah, other so that all that kind of feedback, it just kind of like was became kind of a medium episode for me. Um the whole hog number didn't stand out too much for me because it just seemed like an excuse. They made a whole skit around we have these small motorcycles, we have to use them. I don't know. That's why I was surprised when you said it's a big standout number because, yeah, technically it was hard, but it's just like, eh, this is not very exciting. It's just they feel like they really want to shoehorn into these uh, small motorcycles they found. <laughs> I don't know. Now, I disagree. I think the the movement, the fact that you got to see almost full body Muppet in there, the fact mm. that they were actively moving these motorcycles as the as the performance went on, the motion of the whole thing with the blowing smoke was, I think, a great effect. Oh, technically amazing. And that's why, I'll, you know, Muppeteering moment might be uh, mentioned later. But yeah, absolutely. But like, but and not only that, good composition, Piggy in the lead. So, I mean, I, I kind of disagree with you on this one in that I think that for me, that's like the standout. Like that's, ah. if anything, I was like, I imagined this in a better episode. Well, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that did stand out for me is this feel like it's been a long time since Piggy's had her own number. Like That's true. There's been get... less Piggy this season. Yeah, exactly. So that was kind of I stood um, out. Oh yeah, she hasn't had a number in a while, so good for her. And we got kind of two lesser regular bits that I feel like we're seeing less and less, which is Muppet News Flash. We got a Muppet News Flash. Flash. Uh <laughs> and we got a uh we got Muppet Sports, Wild World of Muppet Sports. 
I'm starting to Lewis feel Kizager. that Muppet Sports is becoming my favorite segment at over Veterinarian's Hospital. It's always well, hey, we haven't gotten nearly that many Veterinarian's Hospitals. True, but Muppet Sports is always so different and so season. funky and interesting. Like instead of just always it the same very kind left of puns, field. yeah, it's always left field, something totally different. So I think it's becoming my favorite segment on the show. Um, so no, but I'm kind of with you. This is really a mixed bag episode. Yeah, but the highs and lows, none of them were really because of Anne Murray. She was in the right in the middle the whole time. <laughs> she was in the middle. The episode fluctuated wildly around her. <laughs> That's a very accurate <laughs> statement. Yes. <laughs> She was totally Will this end up on my top three? Probably not. Will this end up on my bottom three? Probably, Probably not. not. I'm with you right there. <laughs> uh, well, music this week, I Get Around by the Beach Boys. It was a hit from 1964. Uh, this song was finally a slap in the face to the British invasion, as this was the first number one single from a U.S. group in the U.S. for eight months Wow. It had been eight months since a U.S. group had been number one in the U.S. because of the British invasion. That's crazy. Uh, Snowbird uh, by Gene McClellan, a Canadian lyricist. Uh, Murray wasn't the only artist to do songs from him. McClellan's songs uh, were also performed by the likes of Elvis Presley, Joan Baez, and Bing Crosby. Mm. Is this the old Sal? This is a British folk song. It was arranged by some uh, for the show by musical associate Derek Scott. Um, but it was originally put into three part harmony by a composer named Alexander Lee in the early 1800s. And it was a favorite in uh, London supper clubs in the 1820s. Oh, yes, of course. It took a lot to find information on this. That's a lot of information. Uh, <laughs> Walk right back. It was made famous by the Everly brothers. They also mm-hmm. are well known for their big hits. like Bye bye love. Wake me. Wake up little Susie. And all I have to do is dream. Uh, Dancing on the Ceiling, this was originally composed for the, Lon- this is the the, the like missing yeah. number. It was originally composed for the London music musical Evergreen in the 1930s. Uh, Evergreen is about uh, Harriet, who is a music hall star who gets pregnant out of wedlock and takes her baby to South Africa to raise her. Years later, the child comes back to London and tries to get into the music business. A promoter recognizes her, uh, a guy named Tommy, and tries to pass her off as her mother, returned. The public buys it and thinks that Tommy is the baby she had. And this only gets more complicated when Tommy and Harriet fall in love. What the hell? <laughs> yeah, man, it's crazy. <laughs> uh, and then finally, Everything Old is New Again by Peter Allen, who is an Australian singer and songwriter. And his song, Arthur's Theme, uh, better known as Best That You Can Do, actually won an Oscar. Hmm. The guy who wrote that song for Arthur's Theme. There you go. Uh, so, German, what did you think was the best Muppeteering moment this week? I, even though I wasn't that excited by it, I still definitely recognize the technical acumen of, that was required for that motorcycle um, sequence. So, yeah, that was definitely my most best Muppeteering moment. I loved uh, all the Muppets on the skateboards. Oh, really? In the final <laughs> number, just that because you the it, you see the Muppets always put a lot of effort into moving like they're walking. And having that pace right. and moving places. So to see them moving like so seamlessly and so fluidly was like kind of a nice pace and really helped me to imagine that they were actually on roller skates because it's so unnatural to see them do that. For us to see that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> so, Jarman, what happened on this week's episode of Star Trek, the animated series? Oh, boy. So we have the magics of Megas 2. So the Enterprise is on a mission to explore the center of the galaxy, but really they should be saying universe, where supposedly the Big Bang would still be happening and matter would still be being created, which isn't really scientifically accurate anymore, but that's fine. We'll wave a hand for that. When they arrive, they're (laughs) caught in some kind of energy vortex and they escape by going to the center of it or the calm in the eye of the storm, as it were. And all the ship systems then go down, including life support. But just before they're about to pass out from lack of oxygen, a weird satyr guy appears with killer abs and pecs. They're amazing. Uh, he has 0% body fat. And he has a huge smile on his face, and he gives them their life support back. He then takes Spock, Kirk, and Bones down to his planet uh, immediately, like he transports them, which he says is called Megas 2. Um, not the number 2, but T-U. And that is really, it's in a different parallel universe, but here magic is real. And suddenly, this guy's name is Lucian, he tells them. 
And suddenly he freaks out and sends them back to the Enterprise and tells them to try to be cool and not to get discovered. So they're all confused. They don't know what the hell's going on. So while they're waiting for him to come back because they can't go anywhere, their ship only has life support, uh, the crew begins to figure out that they can now do magic as well. Uh, but this makes Lucian appear again on the ship and tells him to stop because this will attract the others of his race, the Megans. <laughs> Which sounds like a bunch of Karens or something, the Megans. Yeah, <laughs> the Megans are just slightly more fun. <laughs> yeah, more fun than Karens. Uh, sorry, Mom, if you ever listen to this, your name's Karen and you're not one of them. Oh, I'm sorry, Karen. <laughs> That's right. But it's too late and the Megans find them because they sense them, someone using magic powers up in space and they transport them back down to the planet. But now the planet looks like it's in 17th century Earth in Massachusetts during the witch trials, the Salem witch trials. So the whole crew is imprisoned in the, in the we call them the stocks, I guess you'd call that. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And the leader of the Megans, a man calling himself Asmodeus, tells Kirk and the crew that they are an ancient race from another universe. And at one time they journeyed to Earth back in the olden days, back like the ancient days. And they try to guide humans throughout history, often with magic, people like Merlin kind of guiding people as wizards. But then when the time of the witch trials came around, the Megans were hunted and killed by the humans as witches. So they all gathered and they went back to their home planet here on Megas 2. But Lucian, the guy who initially found them, that satyr guy, was sad about it because he liked the humans. And oh yeah, we find out he's actually what we think of as Lucifer by the myths and everything. So Asmodeus wants to put these humans on trial, basically, for the crimes of their Earth's ancestors back in the witch trials. But he allows Spock to represent them in the trial because he's a neutral party as he's a non-Earthling. And Spock calls Kirk as a witness, and Kirk tells the Megans to scan the Enterprise's computers, and then they can get the whole history of Earth and how far they've come since the Salem Witch Trials. This causes Asmodeus to change his mind about imprisoning the humans, and he no longer fears more visitors from Earth coming here, but he still thinks Lucian should be punished for all eternity for meddling with the situation and causing the humans to be here in the first place. But Kirk pleads with Asmodeus to, to not punish Lucian like that as it's cruel and unjust. And Asmodeus reveals then that this was just a final test and that Kirk passed it since he had sympathy Shh. for Lucian, even though he knows that he's Lucifer. And they let them go. Peace, happiness all around. <laughs> so, so, Steve, what do you think of this episode? Uh, so, all right. Some things I liked. Um, I like the whole idea of like the center of the space storm. Like, well, you have to push through, Captain. It was a good driving force, and it, like, helped logic out why the hell they were going to do this plan. Um, I mean, like, it, I put this in the positive thing of, like, where the hell did this satyr come from? I love it. <laughs> and why the fuck is this guy so yoked? Yeah, exactly. Like, like he, he, like, he was, like, the Incredible Hulk, this guy. <laughs> He wasn't that big so that there was dark, deep lines of just, muscles. Like, like they, they, they just, every muscle that could exist, existed. Yeah. And then maybe some extras. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I like the idea of them, uh, of the, the Megas, uh, Megans, uh, helping early humans. I thought that was an interesting angle to take. And then a further, I thought the development further that then they were tried as witches mm -hmm. was really fitting. Like it felt good and it felt like a good reveal as the audience. Makes sense. Um, and then, yeah, once again, fun. It, just in the same way in Star Trek, the original series, it was always fun to like see the crew go to a completely jarring time. The same rules applied here to see the 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 crew suddenly in in old Salem. Yeah. That's true. Um, dislikes. Um, uh, a lot of the worlds we've seen, and this this is maybe for the overall series. A lot of the worlds we've seen feature really similar features and no hard lines on the buildings odd uh like moon shaped building shapes and the same color palette and i understand they have budget stuff but like you can really feel that the same artist did all of these yeah and not necessarily like in a good way the more the, the more of this show i'm seeing i know they wanted bright colors but yeah there's a lot of that the same kind of bright colors that's true um this this is something that always got to me sort of in um in original series as well, but this one where they, they like, um, they literally chalk it up to space magic. <laughs> like it doesn't come down to a scientific thing or a piece of tech. It's like, yeah, it's just space magic. Um, 
the whole uh, like good alien, bad alien kind of like alliance portion confused the shit out of me. What do you mean? Like, cause the, 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 it took them too long to get to like why this guy's helping them, why the others don't want to help them, why he betrayed the other, like why he's exiled. That just took too long in my opinion to establish. And so I was like, wait, which aliens are we supposed to like? Are we supposed to like any of them? <laughs> um, and then once again, my final, it's, it's weird, just in the end, it was space magic. That's my final note. <laughs> space magic. Space magic. But at least they say it's from the universe it, where, you know, that I looked it up. Sense. Stocks were around, were when the board went across the feet or like the ankles. Oh. The pillory. Pillory. Is the one that was around the neck and, and the hands. So they were in the pillory. Yes. So our audience can picture it if they hadn't already seen the episode. There we mm-hmm. go. Yeah, for me, I, I I thought it was like a kind of a high minded, high concept episode, which was cool. But it would have been more powerful if we hadn't already seen so many all powerful races on Star Trek that have claimed to visit Earth long ago and kind of guided or changed history, like the Who mourns for Adonais and the Methuselah episode and all this stuff. It's like yeah. this has happened a few times before. Like, how do these people not run into each other while they're all at Earth in these ancient times? Like at well, my, my thought also just because like you have throughout Star Trek, all of these conquering factions or evil military leaders like Khan and the Klingons and the Romulans. And like the more I'm seeing these like crazy characters, I'm like, how the fuck is anyone worried about them? And how is not every every alien race making an alliance to like hunt down these ultra powerful beings that could literally destroy all of them. Yeah. Or at least make defenses against them for sure. (laughs) Like that should be the next generation is every single race coming together to go back and destroy and deal with all these super powerful (laughs) beings that were introduced week after fucking week on the original series. (laughs) I just want to avoid all of them. This is possible. All right. We Romulans, you in? we're going to go wipe out the Horda. (laughs) The Horde. Like, yeah. Horde is not all powerful. Horde is nice and sweet. Pain, pain. Um, but I liked Lucy, and he was a lot of fun. Uh, played by uh, Jimmy Doohan, uh, our he does like all the voices on these shows. He uh, did one, and then there was another voice in this episode that it was I could tell was George Takei. Oh, it was uh, when they come up in the view screen of the other aliens. That was definitely George Takei, unmistakable. Yeah, it was definitely him. Um, but I like the fact that also this is cool that a show from this time in like the late seventies was able to give the devil as a sympathetic character and also show that he's not based off anything real in the Bible, but he's an alien. I was like, that's pretty cool. <laughs> like that. They actually could do that back then, uh, on a kid's show technically. Um, but yeah, the whole Salem witch trial thing was cool. Uh, and also, a uh, solid middle upper episode for me. It was, it was fun. It was silly. It was entertaining. I don't know. What, what do you think is your final kind of judgment? Um, this one is not my favorite so far. It just took them kind of too long. And I, I think I disliked the, really the fact that the crew didn't solve any problem. <laughs> they were like literally on the precipice of failing and being imprisoned and like condemned as evil. And they're like, look at our computer. <laughs> Like that, that was the problem solving this episode. They got lucky. That's pretty much all that happened. They got lucky yeah. this episode. If they, if they had been like, what's a computer, then the episode would be over and they'd be dead. <laughs> so that's true. So in that regard, it just didn't feel like, feel like they did anything to warrant them getting out of this situation. <laughs> I should think about that. That's very true. Oh my God. That's funny. So because of that, this is a terrible, but it's probably a, once again, just being a middling episode. So two middling episodes tonight, uh, but yeah, we have some cool trivia for this. Uh, Larry Brody is a writer who originally sent his script in for the third season of the original series of Star Trek, this script, uh, but it was not like this final version, but something similar story wise. Um, but the producer, Fred Freiberger, rejected this script for the So it would have been on live action, which would be interesting. But three years later, he pitched it again to Gene Roddenberry for the animated series. And Roddenberry loved the idea and his script. But according to Brody, the writer, Roddenberry rewrote the entire script like we now know that he does. I feel like that's coming up over and over yeah. again, right? And Brody did not realize this the real... until the episode aired on television. He's like, he wrote, rewrote the entire thing. <laughs> so, yeah, that happens a lot with Gene Roddenberry, apparently. 
that is the real theme of Star Trek. <laughs> Gene will rewrite your Roddenberry ass. getting his fingerprints on as many things as possible. Absolutely. Uh, in the original script, the crew met God, but NBC rejected any reference to God. Uh, the producers changed God to the devil and NBC accepted it. But then finally in Star Trek V, The Final Frontier, the movie, Star Trek was finally able to make a Captain Kirk meets God story. And Gene Roddenberry was trying to do that for years. Um, the Magics of Megas 2 was originally broadcast on NBC and on Saturday, October 27th, right near Halloween in 1973. Uh, when it was re-aired the following spring, all references to Lucy and actually being Lucifer had been edited out. And whether this was the insistence of the network, the sponsors, or others is not known. The removal of this critical plot point uh, detracted much from the rebroadcast. People were very confused, and it just didn't mean much anymore. Um, a later take on this story scenario, where the Enterprise crew meet a powerful person who appears to be the devil, was written as a treatment for the never-produced uh, series Star Trek Phase Two, which was going to come out uh, kind of like right after the animated series, but became the movie eventually, it became the motion picture. But after a series of heavy rewrites over the years, it was finally given to the Star Trek Next Generation episode, The Devil's Do, which came out in 1991 um, with Picard's crew from the Enterprise D. So we'll finally get to that, which is an iteration kind of of this story, but Next Generation. Uh, we kind of see okay, that later on. Okay. So we'll get there. But that's some, this has had more uh, trivia than most of the animated episodes because there's some weird shit that went on behind the scenes. But that's that's it. So what are our Trek connections, Muppet connections this time around? So I've got two very light. Trek connections this week. It was tough. Anne Murray really hasn't done a lot of TV or movies. Mm. Even at the time, or she was mostly shows. Cana- <laughs> did a lot of Canadian stuff, but not so much here in the U.S. Mm. Um, so both Anne Murray and William Shatner are Canadian. That's true. There we go. And <laughs> both Leonard Nimoy and Anne Murray covered the song, Put a Little Love in Your Heart. <laughs> but well, Leonard Nimoy shouldn't have. <laughs> Probably not. I have his album. We have to live in the reality of what happened. (laughs) Well, that's pretty good. That's okay. We didn't have too many connections, but we didn't need them because these were basically the same episode. I mean, they're so similar. I mean, both feature swirling, the crazy space winds that rack the Enterprise, and the twirling Muppets on skateboards. (laughs) Uh, Characters are told something is strictly forbidden. They don't understand why and then do it anyway with bad consequences. So Scooter with the skateboarding and the Enterprise crew doing magic on their ship. Ooh, I like it. Uh, Both feature a higher being kind of becoming prey. The Megas uh, or Megans who went to Earth powerful but ended up being persecuted and and hanged. And Haggis, the bagpipe champion, uh, (laughs) uh, being attacked by his bagpipes. That was a good sketch. (laughs) They went as the, the predator and became the prey. That's true. Uh, both episodes are something that is canceled because someone ruins it. Uh, Kermit smashing through the set of the Mexican hat dancers gets their number canceled. And humans uh, <laughs> persecuting the Megans cancels their furthering of Earth's society. <laughs> Those are kind of a reach, but, you know. It yeah, works. We're, we're, we're stretching out today. Oh, yeah. Transporter oh. now function. Interrupted ah! by that sound. Transporter now function. All right, so it's part of the show where we transport one character from one episode to the other and vice versa. And what do you got for us, Steve? Well, Trek to Muppets, I'm going to bring over Lucian and replace Anne Murray just appearing on stage, just super fucking jacked and then doing magic while cackling. <laughs> Wait, that was Muppets that tried but the same thing. <laughs> Trek to Muppets, yeah. Just him be, just being around and being the most yoked being you have ever seen in your life. Oh, you have Lucian going to the Muppets. <laughs> oh, yeah, from Trek to the Muppets. That's amazing. Lucian replaces Anne Murray. Uh, for my Trek to Muppets, I have Lucian and Asmodeus would trade places with the Green Heap and the Silver Beak of Kuzbane. Uh, it's also a similarity between the episodes that I didn't use earlier because the two of them would fight over their different lifestyles, just like the Muppets did, but come to a compromise in the end. <laughs> I'm up to Trek. I'm going to have the Hogs on Hogs be the ones who went to Earth in place of the Megans. Only to be persecuted for how cool they are. <laughs> uh, I have Muppets to Trek and Murray switches places with Lucian. And in her calm, hippie like demeanor, she'd just be calmly telling everyone how she likes them. And, you know, it's cool. I went to Earth a long time ago and it was really just groovy, man. <laughs> <laughs> Different vibe. That works. But that brings us to the end of episode 88 of the Muppet Trek podcast. 
Join us next time for The Muppet Show with special guest Jonathan Winters. An animated series episode, Once Upon a Planet. So from the lovers, the dreamers, and us. Live long and prosper, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Muppet Trek Podcast. Be sure to follow us on social media on Facebook and Twitter. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. This podcast has been brought to you by A Play on Nerds. <laughs>